Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. This is Jess, and I'm psyched to welcome back my friend and returning guest, Jamie Stein. Hey, Jamie. Hi, Jess. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. So the last time you were on, well, I guess let's give a little bit of background. So just to sort of give people people who aren't familiar with you, you are a therapeutically trained empath and intuitive, and you do have this ability to channel what's going on inside of a person on an unconscious level. Can you just speak to that a little bit about what that means exactly for the skeptics out there? (laughs) (laughs) What it means for the the skeptics? I don't know what it's going to mean for them. But um, no, yeah, in general... I have an ability to sense what's going on with people on an unconscious level and on a deeper level. So what that tends to mean typically is if you're someone who is feeling blocked in a certain part of your life and you don't know why, or let's say you really want a relationship and you're not in one, or you really want more money and you never have it, um, what I'm able to do with people is to drop into their inner landscape and find out, okay, well, what part of you is saying no to the things that you want? What part of you is saying no, um, you know, to your own creative energy and life force flowing and moving so that you can really step into the life that you feel is yours to step into. And I think that there's always invitations for people. I think that our lives are always asking us to, um, basically step into our higher selves. So let's say you're someone who's just, just, I mean, this has happened actually on numerous occasions. Let's say you're someone who discovers your partner is cheating and now suddenly maybe you're going to get divorced or you don't know what you're going to do. It's like, okay, well, what's the deeper invitation here? What part of you may have manifested this reality? And it's like, oh, you always put your own needs aside for the sake of your partner because you thought that's what you had to do to be a good partner, to be a good boy, to be a good girl. And so what this process is asking of you is to learn how to actually advocate for yourself, how to have boundaries, how to assert your own needs. And so in a situation like that and many others, I've actually seen people come out the other side saying, you know what, in a weird way, I'm grateful for this really difficult thing that's happened or this challenge because it's actually challenged me to reconnect with parts of myself that I lost. So, you know, just to wrap this up, I think we're constantly kind of projecting out into the world the circumstances we actually need for our highest growth. So what I help people to do is just to drop in and understand like, okay, this is the part of you that isn't getting expressed. This is the part of you that's been forgotten. This is the part of you that's asking you to like reclaim it so that you can get the things you want in life. Mm -hmm. Here's why this is relevant to all of us. You're also a Bravo super fan and you love using this skill and this gift that you have to help us more deeply understand these people beyond what they're giving us on the show. Like you literally, you do these videos where you drop in to say a Luann or an Erica Jane or a Stasi, and you literally, quite literally like channel their unconscious thoughts and feelings. Yep. <laughs> and it's very interesting. It is highly entertaining. And that's what we're going to do today. So for people who didn't hear the first episode you're on back in March and wow, what a what a, what a ride we've been on since the last time you were on this show. <laughs> the last time you were here, you looked at The Witches of WeHo, Stasi mm-hmm. and Bo. Um, and so today we're going to look at we're, we we talked about doing Denise Richards and in relation to her relationships with Aaron. And you said you had some things about Charlie Sheen. We want to talk about Rinna's motivations in terms of just throwing her friend under the bus. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on Tinsley and Dorinda and, and sc- how Scott fits into all of that. Leah, mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, Leah McSweeney, and then we'll see what it comes up. Like maybe if you have some thoughts about Sutton, anything that you feel into. So let's start with Denise Richards. Oh, uh, you want me just to go? I mean, there's so much to say with regards to Denise. I think to me, the situation that's going on with Denise and the woman in a lot of ways feels very energetically similar to what happened last season with the cast and Lisa Vanderpump in that For me, I think there's a lot going on. I don't think this is just a simple case of, 
all the women just, you know, want to pick on one person and they're jealous of Denise. So they're going after her. I don't think that's what's going on at all. I think for each woman, there's like a different thread happening here. And there's just, a, it's like a perfect storm of all these different threads coming through all at once. And I do think, you know, much like with Lisa Vanderpump, I do think there is an initial seed that Denise planted that on some level she needs to take responsibility for. But then I think that seed has just sort of triggered a height, an, un, an unnecessarily heightened response in the other women. So it requires a little bit of dismantling. So if I were to dismantle it, this is kind of what I would say. I think that for Denise, I think if we sort of go back to that original barbecue in question that was at her house, right? I do think like when I drop into into Denise at that barbecue, um, I definitely feel she was really triggered and charged. Like it really was a feeling of like when these women are talking about threesomes and, you know, sex at the dinner table, Denise to me feels like, oh shit, like I got to shut this down. Like it really feels like uh, as Denise, the narrative is getting out of my hands. This isn't what I want to do this season. I have got to lock this shit down now. And I am, I'm charged about it. And so then when I drop into that a little bit more, and kind of feel around the flavor of that, I do think a lot of this has to do with what happened last season. And Lisa Rinna actually spoke to this on the show, and I agree with her. I think that Denise did kind of let herself be more of an open book last season. And the fact is, I think it is a little disingenuous now. This is the thing. I understand why the other women are a little taken aback by her feelings because, you know, Denise keeps saying, oh, well, that was a private conversation amongst adults. But let's be real. That's a little disingenuous. It wasn't just a private It was filmed for television. Exactly. It was broadcast on <laughs> national global TV. And, you know, I know at least one of her daughters is a teenager. And so it's like, you can't tell me that doesn't get back to her daughter. Right. And so I think for Denise, the flavor I get off her control at that dinner is this sense of kind of like, oh, shit, I, I kind of embarrassed myself last season. And when I feel into that, it really feels a little bit like almost like a panic, like, uh, what did I do? Like, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Like almost this sense in her of like, somehow I let this get away from me. Like, it's so important to me that people don't think of me this way, that I'm not associated with Charlie in this way, that I'm not associated as like a bad girl or a wild thing or someone who's sort of like all over the place. Like, it's so important to me that I'm seen in a certain light and somehow I let this get away from me. And it's almost this energy of like, oh, Denise, you kind of fucked it up again. Like, how did you let yourself do this? Now I got to kind of get the toothpaste to add back into the tube. Like, I got to rein this back in. So that's where I think she's at at this dinner where but, it's like but she do you, can't. But do you think this is all her subconscious guilt about whatever went on with Brandy? No, no, no. I think it's so. Uh, see, this is this is why it's such a it's such a big issue. It's like I think this is a much deeper split in her between what it means to be a wild thing and what it means to be a good girl. I think that. Um, Denise definitely, I, it feels to me like an older pattern of I can be one of two things. I can either be the wild thing who's sort of sexually free and doesn't give a fuck, or I can be the good girl. I can be the good wife. I can be the good mother. And I think that she, if I had to guess, the flavor of it to me feels like, yeah, that she learned some lessons growing up. That she's, if like, if I have all of my wild energy, which feels like it's a real part of Denise, I'm going to get judged for it. I'm going to be misunderstood for it. And there's a way that she's internalized that for herself. And so I do feel a voice inside of her throughout all this basically saying, like, don't fucking judge me. You know, I feel like that's kind of what she wants to say deep down. Uh, but again, it feels very unconscious. And so I think for her in the place where she's bought into this idea that it's one or the other, she's kind of having a struggle of like, no, don't see me this way, I'm actually good. Whereas I think the real invitation for her here, like if I were working with Denise and all this, I think what I would wanna support her in is like, no, Denise, you can actually both be the wild thing who has kind of this free sexuality and you're outspoken and you're a free spirit, 
And you can also be a good wife and mom at the same time. You can have both. And if someone comes along and says, hey, what's wrong with you? You get to say, fuck off. This is who I am. But I don't think she's really sort of understood that for herself yet. And so if you want to bring in the Charlie Sheen thing just to go way back, what I get off of her and Charlie and Please understand, I actually know very little about their marriage and the divorce, so this is truly me kind of feeling into things intuitively, but the vibe I get off her, it's like going towards this marriage with Charlie Sheen, what it feels to me is like, okay, I get to have it all here. I get to have like this bad boy where kind of like behind the scenes, we can both be wild and kind of crazy and chaotic, but I also get to have this super successful Hollywood actor where everything kind of looks good on the surface. So it almost feels to me a little bit like a deal with the devil. It's like, I get to have my cake and eat it too. Like this sort of gives me everything. And so I think what she didn't plan on was Charlie totally self-combusting and losing all control. And so then what I feel off her towards Charlie is like a real sense of betrayal, like a real sense of like, wait a second, this isn't what I signed up for. I was supposed to be safe with you. And now once again, here I am having to clean up this mess. It's that familiar feeling of like, oh shit, like I was supposed to be able to like have it all. Now the wildness has gotten away from me. I got to clean this up. I got to clean this up. So it's like you start to see a pattern here, right? It's like she had to clean up the marriage with Charlie. Now she has to kind of clean up what happened last season. And so that's why I think this is a much deeper pattern in her life of like, oh, Denise, like you let it get away from you. And I think that's why she's so charged around it. And I think if you want to bring in Aaron, You know, as part of this, I think what I see with Aaron, so it's like, okay, she kind of made this deal with the devil, with Charlie, that went totally, it blew up in her face. So Aaron's so interesting to me because my sense of him is that he has a ton of, like, wild, sexual, masculine, powerful energy in him, but he has a real relationship to being the good boy. Like, my sense of Aaron is kind of like, almost like he's got his own inner conflict around being such a strong, powerful, masculine man. And he's concerned about like wielding it destructively, making other people uncomfortable. So I'm this good guy. I'm in the healing arts. I'm going to be a stand up husband. I'm going to be a stand up stepfather. Like I'm a good guy. And so I think what that allows Denise is to be more in control of the wildness. It's like she's got a wild guy, but it's on a leash. So now she's sort of in the driver's seat and she's wearing the pants. She's got a guy who's a lot more controlled and wants to be good. And therefore she gets to yeah remain in control of the situation and it's less likely to blow up in her face, except for the fact that now she's actually coming up against the boundaries of, you know, their marriage, you know, whatever his sort of more conservative streak is, it seems like that's now going to blow up in her face. So it's just so interesting how it keeps blowing up in her face. And what about the controlling side that we see of Aaron, that he was like threatening to like break her hand and to her controlling him in turn, you know, when she's saying, don't speak, like, don't speak, we're on camera. Like there's a real control thing going back and forth between the two of them where they seemingly don't trust she clearly doesn't trust him well because he's not in the entertainment industry and like he can be like a loose cannon on camera and uh, just like stuff he's saying about cancer and being followed and can you speak about that kind of like the paranoia that he has yeah i mean it all well first i just want to say yeah so you see it right there's just such strong threads of like control like she's a control freak and i think that's something about her part of her being a control freak is she uh, somewhat similar totally different in flavor but a little bit similar to erica actually she's such a control freak that part of her being in control is acting like she doesn't need to be in control like she's got this kind of persona of like oh everything rolls off my back. I don't take things too seriously. Like easy come, easy go. But it's not actually true. She actually is a control freak and she's with a control freak. Aaron wants to control his own energy. So as far as like the conspiracy theorists, the way that I sort of perceive that, because it's very ungrounded, right? It's like Aaron just feels like he's not, when I drop into him and his work, It feels to me like he actually has like a lot of powerful energy moving through him and there are things he genuinely does know, but it just feels like he's coming from a place, like the voice that I hear with Aaron is like, 
I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I've got something to prove. I've got something to prove. I've got something to prove. So he wants to prove his goodness through his work. And part of that for me is disowning all this strong, powerful, masculine energy that he has some sort of ambivalent relationship with. So my sense of Aaron is that he doesn't feel totally safe to be fully in his body, to be fully in his pelvis, to be fully in his feet, to be fully in his powerful energy. So he's just kind of like, I mean, you guys can't see me, but my hands are moving upward. It just feels like his energy shoots upward into his head. Mm -hmm. And so from the place of his head, it's just like, okay, I gotta be good. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. This is my work. This is my work. And it gets really ungrounded and scattered. So to me, the conspiracy theory part of him, it just feels like an offshoot of that ungrounded energy. Like it's very hard for him just to bring his energy downward, to be present to the moment and to say, hey, I'm this powerful guy who has this powerful skill set, and I'm gonna help you heal. Instead it's here, it's there, oh my God, they're following us. And my feeling for Aaron actually is like, if he actually were willing to like drop into his body and to wield his energy more powerfully and directly and intentionally. My feeling is like, he is actually a really powerful guy who could really heal a lot of people. Right now to me though, he feels like a, like a hose that's just spraying everywhere. So my guess is like, I bet he like miraculously helps one person over here because the water happens to land right. And then for this person over here, it's a complete miss and they leave being like, that guy's a quack. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He actually reminds me of Lenny in Of Mice and Men. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Right? Like the like this sort of overgrown savant. Well, he's not a savant. Is he a savant in Lenny? Or he's just, there's like a wisdom that moves through him, though, right? Yeah. Lenny? Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. eventually, yeah. like, kills the mouse because he loved he loved it so much. Yeah, his energy, yeah, it definitely feels like he doesn't know how to wield it. And yeah. it feels like it comes from this place of, like, learning somehow that he has to be a good boy, that if he has all this energy, he's a danger to other people. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to like get into the other woman in relationship to Denise. And Can we first talk about Rinna? Because they've been supposedly friends, I guess Hollywood friends in the same circle or so for like the past 20 years. Like what is going on with Rinna that, I mean, is she just so desperate to put on a show and make a show that she's willing to throw her friend under the bus? I think that's part of it. I mean, I think I'll just say as a general note, as a general note, before we get specifically to Rina, uh, just to kind of complete the piece. I So I do feel like the women are actually reacting to something in Denise where she was a bit disingenuous, where she was pissed off and not owning it, where she was angry at them and pretending like it was no big deal. But then, yeah, the problem is the women just go somewhere with it where it doesn't need to go. And that's where I think they have self-responsibility. Now, I think for each of them, it's different. For Rinna, yeah, Rinna, oh boy. She just feels like there's an energy in her that truly is kind of like a viper. Like it feels like, the words I, I hear is like, it's kill or be killed. And I think when I drop into Rinna in relationship to the show, it's kind of like, hey honey, you walked into the lion's den. Like you knew where you were coming in. And it's kind of like what what like kind of not like you get what you deserve, but you knew what you were walking into. And I think for Rita, she does really see the show as kind of like a cutthroat arena. And I think with Denise. And so I think what happens again, there's a lot of layers here. I think when Denise kind of made this little flub where she did act out and she got a little bit disingenuous, I think the kind of the subtext for Rina is like, OK, you made your bed, now you gotta lie in it. Like you kind of offered us up this golden opportunity to come in for the attack. And it's kind of in a way your fault for setting yourself up this way. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with Rinna, there's like an element here of, I think the killer be killed, yes, it's in relationship to the show, but my feeling is that's an energy she already has a deep relationship to. I think a lot of this, by the way, is exacerbated by what she went through with Lisa Vanderpump. I think she really felt set up and taken down by that. I think it really deeply triggered her. And so I think there's also an element here of like, hey, like if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. Kind of like hurt people, hurt people. I got taken down, mm -hmm. it's your turn to get taken down. And she feels a deep sense of pleasure and power there. But just like with Denise, my feeling for Rinna is that it goes back even further. Like that this is a woman who at some point in her life 
was in kind of a trusting, more vulnerable place and just felt like she got taken down. And it sort of set her up to feel like it is kill or be killed. And in the place where she kills others, it just kind of gives her this inflated sense of power and control in a place where she got really hurt and really cut down. And so I think the show just becomes another vehicle for that. And yeah, I think when a woman kind of trips up, it's just like, okay, like you you just threw a piece of filet mignon in front of a tiger. And it's like you get you're gonna get what you deserve, basically. But what about and any I, but what about any sense of loyalty that she would have to Denise, like her friend? I mean, it seems like based on what we're seeing in the mid season trailer and all the clips uh-huh. that, that we're seeing, you know, foreshadowing what's going to happen with you know, it, it does really seem like Rinna is the vehicle for exposing a lot of this along with Denise, along with Brandy. What about just like loyalty toward her friend or is she just like fuck it we got a show to put on that's the thing i think the show gives her an excuse to indulge a part of herself that she likes to indulge so i think she view that's what i'm saying it's like the the killer be kill energy already lived in her because remember that's also at the heart of the a lot of the lisa vanderpump thing she was set up because she and lisa vanderpump were kind of already in cahoots so she was already running her game. She was already poking at people. When you're when you're referring to uh, Rinna being thrown under the bus, are you specifically referring to the Munchausens? Yeah. Okay. Like they're, they're, it felt like there was a collusion. Totally. Yes. That Rinna was more than happy to go along with. And then Lisa Vanderpump kind of beat her at her own game and kind of hung her out to dry. And I think, I really do think that took Rinna to such a place of feeling used and cast aside, which to me feels like it probably has the original flavor of like her original wounding of feeling used and cast aside. And so I think it just kind of put her into overdrive in terms of that killer be killed. So I think there's something already in Rinna that's like, I like this this game or this energy of killer be killed. And so the show, gives me this perfect opportunity. It's like, hey, we're, again, we're going in the lion's den. All bets are off. I don't care if we've fucking been friends for 20 years. You knew what you were walking into. Once you walk into this arena of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, it's killer be killed, and I fucking love it. And I think, again, it's exacerbated by the fact that she got killed early on in her tenure on the show. As far as like the reactions of the other women to what's going on with Denise, the only thing that that's that feels really strong to me is Erica's reaction because yeah. Whereas, because Erica previously had this persona of like, I'm unbothered, I don't give a fuck, so much so that like she basically slept through two seasons of the show, and I'm saying this as like I- I'm in love with Erica Jane, but like right, she yeah. did like sleepwalk through a couple of seasons of the show and you just sort of like resting on her laurels and I wonder if she <laughs> resents Denise a little bit because Denise last season really had the persona of like I'm unbothered like I don't give a fuck but the truth really did come out in that Erica gives so much of a fuck well that's why I say they feel kind of similar to me because I think they both get a lot of mileage out of pretending they don't give a fuck when in reality they both do for me I think Erica's charge around this because Erica was fine with everything Initially, like when they when she first talked about it with Denise, when Denise first brought it to her, Erica was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, it didn't really feel like Erica had anything on it. Erica turned the moment she learned that Denise was still kind of running around complaining about it and sort of casting the other women, you know, as bad moms or negligent of the children, kind of getting on her high horse. And what I get off of Erica in relationship to that is, don't you dare fucking set me up. Like, I think that Erica is starting to feel set up. And I think she's got such a charge around the place where she feels set up by someone, particularly in a place that feels at all kind of like, yeah, like an attack on her character as like a mother in some way, or like, It even maybe has like um, a little bit of a flavor of like her relationship to her own sexuality and sexual energy because they were talking about the threesomes. There's just something about don't you dare turn this against me. It's like that same moment. You know when else we saw this from Erica? Remember last year when they were on her trip and Lisa Vanderpump brought up the condolence card? Yes. And Erica just like slammed her yogurt down. There's something for, and I feel like the same thing came up in her original conflict with Dorit and PK. It's like, don't set me up to look a certain way. There's something about being misunderstood that is so painful to her and it triggers 
this deep, like ferocious, almost like self-protective mama bear energy. And I think that's what's going on. I'm like, Denise, don't set me up to look a certain way. Don't trick me, don't manipulate me. Don't turn something against me, I feel like is what she's saying. So for her, it's like different than it is for Lisa Rinna. And then Kyle, I just think that she's still, I mean, do you want to hear about Kyle or is oh, we done? God, I'm, Kyle <laughs> like honestly exhausts me. Like why is she having a goddamn breakdown? Okay, Cliff Notes version, I think that, <laughs> yeah. and if people, if you want to hear more about Kyle, I do have a whole video that I specifically did about Kyle in this Dorit situation, but like Cliff Notes version, I feel like the Dorit, she was so triggered by the Dorit thing because it was all about boundaries. Like, I feel like Kyle's someone who does not know how to draw boundaries for herself. You know, again, Cliff Notes version is just like totally plays into her mom, sister stuff. She was never allowed to have boundaries. She's not allowed to have access to her full nose. She's not allowed to have access to her full feelings. So when someone like Dorit breezes through with these strong boundaries, mm -hmm. it triggers something deep in Kyle because she's seeing someone who is having boundaries for herself and it kind of triggers this place inside Kyle where it's like, wait, you mean I there is a reality where I could have boundaries. Like there is a reality where I could say no. It doesn't mean I'm not a horrible person. And so I think in that place where Kyle wants to preserve her whole defensive structure, she wants Dorit to pay a price. She wants everyone to be in agreement with her that Dorit's like this bad friend and who's selfish and she needs to pay a price for having had these boundaries. So when Denise comes in and is kind of like, who the F cares? it triggers Kyle even more. And so now Kyle is deeply, overly pissed at Denise because it's hitting her in this really deep core wound. So kind of like with Lisa in a totally different way, when she sees Denise kind of tripping over herself a little bit, that sort of disowned anger in Kyle, that anger she won't let herself have towards her mother, towards Kim, you know, towards herself for betraying her boundaries, it's coming out now at Denise. Mm -hmm. You're gonna pay the price for taking Dorit's side. I'm mm -hmm. gonna take all this out on you and it's gonna feel so good because you triggered me somewhere so vulnerable that I don't even wanna look at. Does that make sense? I'm really abbreviating. Yeah, that, may, that, that does make sense. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to hear what you think of Sutton. Sutton, I get major Jennifer Aiden energy off her. She just feels like really <laughs> Really weird. Like, I think that she she feels like she's got a strong relationship to being an outsider, uh, which is why it's so interesting to me that she actually ended up being a friend of after all of this. But she feels like an outsider. She feels to me someone who is like a little kooky, a little eccentric. Um, I don't think like, you know, the reason why I said Jennifer Aiden, you know, when Jennifer Aiden first came on the scene and she was kind of bragging about her house and this and that. I didn't actually really get the sense that she was a true snob. She felt to me like kind of a weird woman who was trying to connect and that she is excited about these things and she wants other people to be excited about it too. And I feel something similar for Sutton where it's like, she doesn't feel like a Dorit or even an Erica Jane where it's like, these are women who like snobs, like they love nice things. Sutton to me feels sort of like this kooky little girl who's like trying on dresses and playing a part and sort of trying on different identities. And I think, you know, my vibe off her honestly is like, I think she sort of came into this world, this eccentric little girl. It feels to me like she probably didn't really get support for like her eccentric individual energy. And on top of that, it feels like she was probably spoiled. So you sort of see what you're seeing now is this combination of like this little girl who feels sort of like a little misunderstood, like her heart feels misunderstood. She doesn't quite have a clear place in the world, but she's also kind of spoiled and entitled. That for me connects to the place where she feels scared to me. I don't know if I said this earlier. So she does feel scared to me. Like I just feel like in that place where she feels like, and I think there's a place in her that feels like she's an outsider. I feel like she feels like she doesn't belong. When I drop into her in relationship to the other women, like that's what comes up for me. Like I literally see the other woman kind of standing far away from her in front of like a Beverly Hills mansion and she's on the sidelines. So I think there really is something for her around finding her place both within this group, but also the world at large. So yeah, if you put a camera on you, it's sort of going to magnify that. The whole show is about cast dynamics and kind of where you fall in relationship to the group. So if you're someone who has a lot of fear and trepidation about where is your place, 
it kind of makes sense that you're going to be really sort of conscious of the fact that the world's watching. And, you know, am I going to continue to basically be an outsider? Which, again, it's so interesting that she then did continue to be an outsider by becoming a friend of rather than a housewife. I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, it was Rinna who brought Sutton on. Yeah, was it you who was just telling me that? Because that was shocking to me. Yeah, yeah. I totally forgot that. She brought Sutton on and immediately was like, I don't know her. (laughs) Like, immediately was just like, yeah, she's a fucking whack job. It just like distanced herself. Do you think it was one of those things where like they basically didn't know each other beforehand and the show is like, Rina, you're bringing her on? Yes. Yeah, that's probably, that's what I feel. Yes. And I think the real distancing started right at the jump when... Sutton insisted that they film at the Dolce and Gabbana. I don't, I don't know if it was like their house or a showroom, wherever they were when Rinna tried on the crown um, with mm-hmm. all of the controversy surrounding Dolce and Gabbana. Sutton may or may not be aware of all of that. Rinna most certainly is. And I'm sure Rinna felt very icky and self-conscious about the fact that she was going to be seen there seemingly buying into the Dolce, you know, the Dominica Dolce and Gabbana world which is Mm -hmm. extremely problematic and a really bad bad look for rena so i think immediately she started just distancing herself from sutton yeah well she could have said no but uh meaning she could have said no to going Mm -hmm. but um yeah as you speak what i hear from rena to sutton is kind of like better you than me You know, so again, it's that kind of kill or be killed. I think that Lisa, it's interesting because when I think about it now, Lisa Rinna actually has a lot in common with Lisa Vanderpump. I actually think there's quite a connection between the two of them. But I think that, yeah, I think Lisa Rinna kind of, she's playing chess from the beginning. Like, I think she kind of positions herself. She's sort of looking at what's out there in, in the landscape of the show. And she's kind of figuring out which horse to bet on. And she has a great way of like, Oh, I'm just asking innocent questions. Denise, I'm just innocently asking you about wild things. And oh, how did you talk to your daughters about that? Like, she really knows how to kind of get in there in such a cold, cutting, calculating. I mean, I kind of love it in a weird, because it's such a femme fatale energy. Totally. And I do think, like, if if you were to think about what's the higher self version of this, you know, like I think, you know, cause Lisa's smart and she's perceptive and she's intuitive and destructive energy is actually, it can have a deep higher self because, you know, you take things down to create a new. And I think in a higher self version of Lisa Rinna, she could sort of quote unquote, take people down to help them find the truth of who they are in an effort to like help build them back up. Unfortunately, right now in her lower self, she's just getting a lot of pleasure out of taking people down to watch people fall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it makes her feel powerful and good. But she, you know, but I'm saying all that because there there is a there's just there's a very dark, dangerous energy that's quite magnetic that when I talk about it, I'm like, oh, it feels good. It's riveting. You know? Yeah, it's, there's a way that she's likable. To me, anyway, you know, like yeah. she's got a powerful, she's good at what she does. She's a little dangerous. And, you know, she's playing a game. She plays it well, you know. Mm-hmm. Let's jump over to New York. And I really, really want to go deep on Leah, specifically with regard to her relationship with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Well, Yeah, it's multifaceted. So I think with Leah coming into the season, I really, when I dropped into Leah and alcohol, it really felt like, um, like a waiting game to me. Like it felt to me like she knew, like, like she was never 100% serious about like giving up alcohol forever. Like kind of like, you know, it's like when someone, even though she was nine years sober. Yeah. Yeah, it felt to me like someone who is giving up cigarettes for a while, but is kind of just waiting for that moment when they can have the first cigarette again. That's kind of what it felt like to me. And I think this is my thing with Leah. I think that she she has this deep relationship to being misjudged. And so she kind of reminds me of someone, 
you know, it's like that old adage or that old kind of trope of someone who will make fun of themselves before you can make fun of them. I'll make fun of my weight before you can make fun of my weight. I'll make fun of the zit on my face before you can make fun of the zit. Because then I'm in control and I'm kind of controlling the experience. I feel like with Leah, she is someone who had a really early experience of like feeling misjudged and misunderstood. And we've seen some of this play out in the show with her parents. And that that is so painful to her that she now kind of goes through life basically with the subtext of like, I know you're gonna get it wrong about me and I'm gonna prove you wrong about your wrong judgment. But like there's this chip on her shoulder that's basically saying you're wrong about me. And I think she came into the housewives with that energy of like, you're fucking wrong about me. And so the, the reason that I relate this, so you know, to bring this to like the drama in the housewives, she'll act out, right? And like get drunk and like, you know, behave sort of outrageously at this dinner. And then she gets to spend all this time being like, hey, don't judge me for doing what I do. Like, this is cathartic for me. And this is why it's okay. It's like just that energy of like, you're wrong about me. Don't you judge me. Like, this is why you're wrong about me. With the alcohol, I kind of feel like part of that initial stint of sobriety was this kind of like, hey, I can do this. And I think it's really interesting though that she wasn't in recovery. It's not like she was like in surrender around it. It does feel to me like this flavor of like, yeah, I'll show you. I can stay away from alcohol. I don't have a problem. I can do this. You think I have an alcohol problem? I'm staying away for nine years. But deep down underneath that kind of knowing that there's this kind of waiting game of when she can go back. And I do think part of the reason why she went back to alcohol, especially in context of the show, was a similar thread of like, I'll show you I can do this. Like you're wrong about my problem with alcohol. I can go back to alcohol and I can do this. So again, it's just, she's constantly proving a point. Even with her fashion line, what did she say on the show? I wanted to show that a woman could make like a men's, or not that it's a men's line, but she could do what a man could do with the street. There's, she's always proving a point. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can't, you're wrong about me. I can do this. So I think that's how she sort of controls the narrative of her life. Now, you did communicate to me before this chat that she has announced that she's now actually in recovery. She, so, she yes, she right before we recorded, we we're recording this, I texted Jamie that Leah, I, I mean, I'm sure by the time this airs, this will be bigger news and like all over the place. But she posted that she posted a three month chip, basically a 90 day chip that she's bit clearly been in AA for the last 90 days, three months sober, which is interestingly the entire length of time Roni's been on the air. So it's interesting, right? So I dropped in. So I think it's great news. I think I think that's great news for her. And I think that um, I did drop in back into her and alcohol after you sent me that text just to see what I felt. And so the energy I get off Leah right now with alcohol is kind of like... It's almost like she's kind of looking at it with a cock eye and it's like she's kind of saying like, OK, liquor, I see you <laughs> like it's kind of like I'll, I'll, you know, like kind of like she's willing to go the next step. Like she understands she kind of got thwarted, you know, in the last battle, let's say. And she now sort of recognizes there's sort of yeah an additional step that needs to be taken. It doesn't feel to me like full surrender at this point, which is fine. I mean, like she's very new to recovery and to sobriety in this way. It does feel a little bit still like I'm tussling with alcohol and I'm going to win. And now winning means like getting sober and being in 12 step recovery. But um, so I think she's still you know, I think there's still some flavor of self-will there for her and I think she enjoys the tussle but I do think it's a really good road for her and I think it's you know it feels like it's going to take her you know somewhere somewhere good I mean look Leah is someone who's got a lot to prove even the stuff I saw some of the stuff that she put out there now like she's got this social media argument I guess with Ramona and she's like you know, taking Ramona to task for traveling and not wearing a mask. And yes. it's like when I see that stuff, I'm like, okay, Leah, is this really about the principle of like what's best for humanity? Or are you just pissed at Ramona and now you're trying to like get any ammunition you get? Like, this is the thing. Leah just has a lot to prove. And I think her deepest healing is going to come when she can sort of let herself drop that load and kind of surrender to the experience of, yeah, some people are going to misunderstand you. Some people are going to misjudge you. Some people aren't going to see your true heart all the way. 
And then I think once she's willing to do that, oh my God, her life is gonna flow so much more because she's not like, she's just fighting, fight. I gotta prove something is what Leah's saying. And it's just like, Leah, stop trying to prove so much. It's taking up so much of your energy. Mm-hmm. Tell me how you feel about Tinsley just dropping off the face, leaving him in the middle of the night, and also Dorinda's complete mental illness and how she's projecting <laughs> it onto poor, poor, sweet little Bambi Tinsley. Well, it's interesting. You know, I hadn't, I dropped into Tinsley and Scott. I haven't specifically dropped into her in the show. Let me, uh, let me just take a moment right now and just see what I get off of. So this is Tinsley and just like Roni, the show. I mean, I do just hear the words, I'm out. <laughs> um, I honestly, I, at the risk of stating the obvious, a lot of this does feel to me like she was having a really miserable time that season. Like, you know, I mean, Dorinda was being quite abusive to her. And I think it just kind of, there does feel like an energy of why would I stick around for this? There's like kind of an, I mean, it's the open door she wants anyway, which is her relationship with Scott, but there's sort of an open door. And it's kind of like, I don't, I don't have time for this. Like, I don't have to stick around for this. Like, why would I? Um, But let me just drop in a little bit further and see if... It's also a feeling of, like, I got what I needed from the show. You know, it's like, this for me was a stepping stone. It was a lily pad. What I've really wanted is the man and sort of the next chapter and the family. It's kind of like I got what I wanted. Uh, So, see ya, you know? And, And you're making this easy on me by being so nasty to me. Um, it feels like also as I'm speaking a little bit like, yeah, it is a feeling like I got what I needed and wanted from this group. Cause like when I suddenly feel into just the group, Luann, Sonia, Dorinda, Ramona, I mean, Tinsley is literally the, well, no, Lee is the youngest now, but she's been the youngest. And, um, it, it's kind of like, there's a bit of a cautionary tale with that group. You know, these are not women who are necessarily living their best lives in their fifties and their sixties, uh, emotionally, let's say. Right. Um, and I think for Tinsley, yeah, there's a little bit of like, okay, like I do have this shot now. And if this is my future, it's not looking so good. So let me, I got what I needed from you guys. Thanks. See ya. And I'm getting out while I still can. Can you drop into Tinsley and Scott? Yeah, I was dropping into that before the call. I, it's it's really interesting. I When I drop into Tinsley and Scott, first of all, what I'm aware of is there's a lot that happens at once, like a lot of powerful feelings that come up at once. I most immediately feel, first of all, a part of her that just wants to be like, just on like an intimacy sexual level, just wants to be taken by him, like really has this deep desire for this sort of burly, manly, masculine sort of energy. Um, But then also on a more emotional level, part of her that just wants to hold on to him and never let go. It's like, take care of me, take care of me, take care of me, take care. Like this is sort of unending sense of need. And so then in that place where she's got all this longing, all this desire and all this need, she gets frozen. And I just feel this deep fear of like, like basically doing or saying the wrong thing that's going to overwhelm Scott, push him away. But also what I'm feeling, make him angry. And it's interesting because I kind of been feeling around Scott, too. And it does feel like there's a lot of anger there. He feels actually kind of like a little bit of a volatile personality. So I think with Tinsley, what comes up around him is sort of like, oh, my God, there's this whirlwind of feeling and emotion. I'm scared of what comes up in me. I'm scared of what it might provoke in him. So let me just freeze. It feels like she's holding her breath. It feels like she's walking on eggshells. And then in the place where she's walking on eggshells, to me, it just kind of feels like if I'm Tinsley, it's just like, oh, let me just think about my closet. You know, oh, let me plan the wedding. If I just sort of play this role of the good, you know, I'm just the fairy princess. I'm the good little girl. Like, let me just somehow I can just push a pause button on all of these like depth of feeling inside of me. Focus on the clothes in my closet, and I just hope everything's going to be okay. But it really feels like she's frozen. And then he, when I drop into him, he's really interesting. He feels like he's real like that. He's got a ton of anger that he's, like, scared of. It feels like he's got a ton of aggressive sexuality that he's scared of. And so when I kind of drop into him in relationship to Tinsley, 
it's sort of this twofold experience of on the one hand, I love that you play this sort of like helpless fairy princess because it allows me to be in power. It allows me to stay in control. I don't get provoked in any type of way that might tip the scales and let some of this energy I'm scared of come through in a really powerful way. But at the same time, I also feel the place where it, it infuriates him. Like it infuriates, like her helplessness infuriates him. And I almost, I would kind of guess that Scott has had a history of having to maybe kind of take care of a woman who seemed helpless. Did, oh, did you happen to watch High Society? No. I th- watch High Society and I'd love to like talk, whatever, we can talk offline about it because the, it shows like this other like dark side of Tinsley coming out of the, the relationship with Topper. Well, that's the thing. It's like people forget. It's like she plays this role so well now, but it's like, let's not forget. She was in what she calls an abusive relationship, got drunk, got arrested. It's like, that's not a normal Sunday for most people. So it's like, there's a lot going on in Tinsley Mm -hmm. um, that gets disowned. And I think, you know, in the Dale of it all, I think she got really set up. You know, I think she got set up to like, I think she was kind of a plaything for Dale. Like, you're the fairy princess. I get to kind of make you my toy and kind of use you in this way. But then it's like, and now I'm going to kind of judge you and shame you for being this helpless little fairy princess. This is how you get the love. And it's also why you deserve the, like, the cruelty and the derision. I feel really bad for Tinsley. I think she's been in a really no win situation and it's exacerbated by the fact that she's independently wealthy because it's like she has no sense of agency in her life she's like dependent on her family for money it's just it's it's i feel really bad for her i think she's got a lot of work to do we have to talk about dorinda Mm -hmm. i do wonder if the only way she can get her life back is to completely leave the show leave the public eye and get back to the person who she was, you know, 15 years ago and just resume a normal life. I don't think the show is good for her. There are, there are several women for whom I don't think the show is good for. And I always think that's such an interesting line, like to think about which women, who don't you think the show is good for? Um, I actually don't think it's good for Sonia. I don't think it's good for Dorinda. I don't think it's, uh, I kind of feel like it's not good for Kelly Dodd. Um, women who I just, who else? Uh, Luann, it might not be good for Luann. A lot of New York. I don't think, I think women where it's like, it really feels to me like you need to tend to your mental and emotional well-being. And it feels like something's getting away from you now. Whereas for me, and again, I find this line so interesting to explore, like someone like Ramona, or like Vicky or Tamara, even though these are women who, you know, do act out and obviously have their issues, there's something, there's just a grounding that they have. And it feels like there's a way that they, well, these are also women who know how to make their own money, which that does feel interesting to me. Like they're not dependent on the show for their livelihood. There's something a little bit stronger about them where I do feel like they can use the show for their lives rather than the show becoming this vehicle for like delusion, denial, dysfunction. It just feels like some of these other women like Ramona, uh, not Ramona, like Sonia and Dorinda, they're getting, like you said, they're getting further and further away from themselves via the show. Whereas I feel like there are certain other women where the show still, I don't know, it gives them something, Mm -hmm. you know? Like I think Tamara is much better off for having been on the show than where she was before. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we're getting away from Dorinda right now, but I just think that's such an interesting, I find that topic personally very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, But I think in terms of the Dorinda of it all, yeah. Here's the thing thing with Dorinda. What I've heard a lot of, a lot of the commentary around Dorinda is people are saying she hasn't properly grieved the loss of Richard. I find the whole Dorinda hasn't properly grieved excuse to be incredibly weak like it cannot be that 
I think that that is perhaps one additional layer, you know, on an overarching pattern. I mean, again, you have to understand, I come from the perspective of we're constantly creating our own reality. So we keep drawing things to ourselves that reflects a deeper pattern. You know, I think with Dorinda, what's so interesting, I mean, I've been in the camp of Dorinda has not properly grieved for years. This is what I've seen with her from the beginning, that this was a woman whose life that John was kind of a placeholder and that there's just a level of grief and rage and maybe even shock that she has just not let herself process. What's been coming through me more this year though is also just kind of that relationship she has to, you know, that she did start out from humble means and that she kind of got herself into New York society and she sort of married up and she has that kind of energy of like, yeah, like, you know, she was kind of a woman who knew how to make her way in the world. And I just kind of wonder about that for her. I wonder about the choices that she's perhaps made. I wonder about places that she's perhaps compromised. And I think where I would sort of pair that with the Richard's death of it all, I do very much feel her currently in a place of like, how did my life end up this way? Like, this isn't what I was banking on by the time I reached this point. And so I do think when she looks at someone like, and I think there has kind of been this fight in her to get somewhere, get somewhere, get somewhere. And she said it, I don't think she's ever felt like she's had space or permission to be powerless or to be helpless. So I think in the place where she's sort of waking up to, I don't know exactly how old she is, but like her mid fifties, she's looking around, is this isn't sort of what she wanted for herself. She's just exerted her will, exerted her will, exerted her will, and this is sort of where she's at. And then she looks at someone like Tinsley, who has a lot of life. I mean, Dorinda has a lot of life left in front of her too, but you know, Tinsley's significantly younger. You know, she's looking at getting married. She's looking at having kids. She's like on the show. She's got a lot of opportunity. She plays helpless. And on top of all, on top of all, I think in Dorinda's mind, she just sees her as you're a trust fund kid who doesn't have any real problems. Again, I don't think that's true emotionally, but I think that's how Dorinda sees it. Um, I think it just brings up just this deep rage and resentment in the place of like you have everything handed to you and you're playing helpless. Like snap out of it, snap the fuck out of it. And I think for Dorinda, the real work for her is she needs to let herself become helpless. Like it's just, I think she just, she needs to put her load down. And um, I think there's just deep resentment. And I hate using this word, but it does feel apt in this context. I think there's a lot of jealousy uh, of what she perceives of as Tinsley's sort of privileged, easy, helpless life where she gets to just float through everything. And in that place where she's so angry that she never got to just be helpless or be taken. That's the thing, Dorinda needs to be taken care of. It feels like she's never felt truly taken care of. And she's outraged and that rage is just coming out. So to bring it back to your point, you know, the death of Richard might just be one more tile in the mosaic of Dorinda doesn't get to be taken care of story. Do you think Dorinda has it in her to walk away from the show? I think the only way she's going to walk away is if it's like through pride so like if the women, if there were a season where she, I mean, maybe that's where the season's headed, I don't know. But if there were a season where the women really kind of turned against her or she was at odds, if she were at odds with everyone and like they were really backing her into a corner of like, you've got to admit some stuff and we're not letting you off the hook. I could see her walking away then. It's hard for me to see her walking away any other way. Very quickly, just jumping over a little bit about Stasi and yeah. th- this sort of whirlpool mess that she's been through. What do you feel when you drop into her right now? I mean, just between the, the, the firings that just all this chaos, this chaotic bad slash good in that, like now she's pregnant and like, where is she at these days? Yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting because it sort of goes against what she's putting out publicly. Uh, when I sort of I sort of dropped into her and I just like kind of visualized the media like hailstorm, and I just felt myself kind of crumple into a ball and retreat into a corner. And it's kind of like head buried into my knees, arms wrapped around my legs. Um, if I just kind of follow that, it's just like oh no no no. It's like no 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 no. Like this can't be happening. This can't be happening. This isn't happening. So I think there's probably still a lot of disbelief. 
um, and just, I think, wanting to disbelieve. So maybe that makes sense in terms of like, you know, because people, I don't really follow the media that much, but I've seen some stuff about how she's like making baby announcements. And, you know, some people have kind of been like, what is she doing? Like, this isn't sort of how you handle and it, it. And in some ways, that feels right to me. It's this kind of feeling of like, I'm not fully letting in what's happened here. And I'm kind of maybe in crisis mode, but underneath that crisis mode is a denial that I'm, yeah, I'm just not fully letting this in yet. I can't let this in. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't fully take in what's going on yet. Anybody who didn't hear the episode that I did with Jamie in March, he had a very, you, you had a very, very great take on the Stasi and Bo romantic relationship. What do you, has anything changed there? Well, I don't, I mean, if you want, I can go in about that. But, you know, what I feel, you know, I have felt around about like, you know, because when Stasi got fired and then was pregnant in one week, <laughs> I was riveted by that. And yeah. I was just like, wow, what is, what's, you know, again, in the place where I feel like the universe is always giving us invitations, I was like, what, what, what's the spiritual task here for Stasi? And when I felt into it, I really felt like, oh, this is about her stepping into womanhood, you know, to me. And so this connects, because, you know, I talked about how she sort of clings to these guys, you know, and I always feel this energy of clinging with Stasi. Like there's a little girl in her that wants to be rescued. And so I feel that with her with the show, with Bravo, with podcasts. It's like, I got to cling to these things to be successful. And I cling to this identity as this sort of privileged, basic bitch. And what I feel for her in all of this, in the place where she lost everything, suddenly she's pregnant. So it's like, she's responsible for this other life. I was like, you know what? The invitation here is for her to grow the F up. This is about Stasi letting go of the things she's been clinging to and stepping into herself as an empowered woman as opposed to a basic bitch and basically saying, okay, like I got a life to take care of. Let me take responsibility for myself. I'm not going to go and like try to beg for my job back from Bravo. How do I create my own fortune now? And for me, part of this is like, how do I also grow from what's happened? Because I did some shitty privileged stuff that was racist, you know, whether it was conscious or not, you know, how do I, like, let me start taking responsibility for myself as like a human being and as a woman and as the creator and generator of my own success. And then when I feel into that for her, it's kind of like, I mean, the potential I feel for her is like, Bo, you go and figure, you go do your thing over there. Like, I don't need to drag you along on my podcast tour anymore as like my security blanket as like my teddy bear that I cling to because I'm I'm a little girl I'm a little basic bitch and like this is what I do it's like no let me step into this because Stasi she is a manifester and she you know I don't particularly like her but like she's a power she's got a powerful energy it's why she's been successful up until now so I feel the invitation for her here is just like let go of the things you've been clinging to take responsibility for this new life you're creating and for your own life Step into the powerful woman. Create some stuff. Fantastic take. Like, I I love yeah. it. Yeah. I guess just sort of shifting gears a little bit, how do you think Bravo will be able to, like, long term, I mean, like, throughout, you know, moving forward even into, like, 2021, like, we're about to, you know, the only thing they really have filmed after Potomac is Salt Lake City, a franchise that I'm not looking for. And I don't think anybody's looking for that. You know, uh, I am. I'll be on record that I oh am God. looking for it. I've been looking for it since the moment they announced it. I was like, this is going to be so good. So what? I'll be the lone voice on that. <laughs> What? Like even now, like you need another group oh. of 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 white, straight women. Oh. Well, okay, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to have a diverse cast, but I think now more than ever, I think some of these franchises are a little long in the tooth. Yeah, bring on a new group of women and Salt Lake City. Oh my God, I want to see it. I want. This is the thing. I'm not one of. The, this is why Orange County has always been my favorite. I grew up in Boston. I lived in New York. I live in LA. Like I get it. I get New York. I get Atlanta. I get Beverly Hills. I want to see a world I've never seen before. Show me Orange County. That's what I want to see. I want to see Salt Lake City. I want to see Mormons. Not that they're all Mormons. I want to see the liberal people of Salt Lake City. I want to see the snowy mountains. I Show me a world I've never been to. I'm ready for Salt Lake City. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess, you know, moving forward, like, where do you see Bravo going, you know, in a post, we'll say a post Salt Lake City world? I mean, do you, do you, <laughs> like, do you think that they're going to start landing these planes of, you know, OC? Like, do we really need, like, a 30th season of Real Housewives of Orange County with, 
you know, lunatics like Kelly Dodd on there. Like, do you think eventually Bravo will start landing some of the Housewives franchises and maybe somebody internally taking over for Andy? Like, do you have any, like, have you had any intuition regarding where, like, this world, this sort of Bravo cinematic universe is going big picture wise? I don't have any intuition. I mean, it's an interesting question. I was just thinking about this last night. Like, what is it going to take for the housewives to finally end? I think what's interesting, though, I saw some mention that, was it from Candy? I think it was from Candy that they were actually, I, I know it was at least Candy. It also may have been Portia. Like, they were having actual conversations with Bravo as a network about change that can be implemented, you know, I don't know. I saw an article about it. I didn't see the actual thing. But like my understanding was that there's actual behind the scenes talks happening now. So, you know, when I hear that, I mean, look, I think it's interesting. People certainly in the pandemic, I don't know about from a ratings perspective, but from kind of like what I get through the echo chamber of my own social media, it seems like people have really been turning a lot to this television programming, you know, as like a way of, you know, having entertainment and, you know, being connected to other people. So, It might be interesting to see, given that there are now kind of behind the scenes conversations happening, there is consciousness that's cracking open. Bravo does seem like it's making new choices. Maybe we're going to get kind of a new landscape of reality television. Um, And if maybe they can keep up with the changing times, um, perhaps it will all continue to unfold. Or, you know, what will happen is they'll just kind of be like, that's the thing, you can't kind of predict what's going to hit. You know, some of this is like sort of kismet. I mean, Bravo was nothing before like Project Runway. You know what I mean? It's like, remember those days? And then like Real Housewives of Orange County, would that have been at all successful had it not aired during the writer's strike? You know what I mean? But Mm. it did air during the writer's strike. And now look where we are. So it's kind of like, how can we know until we're there? <laughs> we kind of need to see what happens as the pandemic, you know, we get the reins on that. Life kind of recalibrates. Bravo's trying new things in the wake of Black Lives Matters and, you know, just all the, you know, all the diversity issues that are coming up as a result of that. And then who knows what idea for a show someone's going to have that's going to land in a certain kind of way that's going to give birth to a whole new empire and may- we just don't know. But it's exciting. You know, my hope is that, this is my hope, Jess, is like, I think the challenge in front of us is that there is this sort of massive shift in consciousness that's occurred. But what's now required is we have, for there to be true long-term sustainable change, it requires an ability and a willingness to bring nuance and complexity to this conversation. And without the nuance and without the complexity, if we're just resist like if we're just depending on cancel culture to get us through, everything's just gonna go back to normal, you know? And I and I feel this interesting place where it's like it feels like there is something more complex and more nuanced that, that wants to come through. But look, this is like this is a truly complex, nuanced conversation in a world that has not typically held space for nuance or complexity. So I think there's going to be some rough going, and I think we're going to really need some new leaders, some new thought leaders coming to the forefront who are really paving the way to like hold space for a new and emerging consciousness. I do feel it's possible. I really do. And I feel like it's here, and I feel like it wants to emerge. But no, this isn't something that's all getting resolved in the next six months we're undoing centuries worth of history and i don't think it has to take centuries to undo but it ain't happening in the next six months you know right. what i'm saying it, it, it's not happening in phase four <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly jamie uh you're really one of my favorite people to talk to on and oh, offline um tell everybody you know, if people want to work with you or do a session with you one on one, you know, I've worked with you privately long before I even had a podcast. Tell people how they can, well, first of all, find you, but also what it looks like to have a session with you and just what it's like. Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, definitely if you're on Instagram, go follow me there. It's at Jamie Stein, J A M I E S T E I N. And I do, po- as you know, I post Housewives related videos. I drop in. There's all sorts of content there. And sometimes you can ask me little quick hit questions. So it's it's a scene. 
and then as far as your other question, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in possibly doing some work, first of all, uh, hit me up at my website, which is hollywoodreadings.com. And um, yeah, it, it starts, you can book an individual session. And basically what I ask people to do is like bring a question about your life you want to ask or bring one or two questions about your life. And then basically what we do is we just use that question as a jumping off point to really explore one, like what is this situation revealing to you? And then to start exploring like who are you and who wants to come forward and what parts of yourself do you need to support yourself in this process? So it's cool. It's really a space. It's honestly what it is on the most fundamental level. It is a space where you will be deeply seen and heard, perhaps in a way that you've not felt seen and heard before. And you might very well get access to parts of yourself you haven't even like let yourself know yet or that perhaps you don't think you're allowed to have. So I think it's a really validating experience where you get permission and support to be connect connected to the authentic parts of you and then to get information about like what's standing in the way of just sort of letting yourself flow and having the things you want in life. And I will say people tend, people get a lot out of the individual sessions and often come back kind of saying this happened, then that happened, then this happened. And that said, yeah, there are some people who want to keep going and I have different ways that I sometimes work with people on a more ongoing basis to really help them like just go with their journey. Um, but it all just starts with an individual session. And for some people, that's more than enough. Awesome. Jamie, I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. I found this to be so fun and so entertaining as well. Um, you can follow me, Jess XNYC. Uh, follow the show account, Hot Takes Deep Dives. Um, would love if you left a, a five-star review on iTunes. And we will see you soon. Thanks, guys. <laughs>